Uh, so Clive, I see that you're in your studio and you have the actual work that is online right now in the Future Fair. Uh, Future Fair was meant to be a profit sharing, it still is, a uh, profit sharing uh, new type of show where the, the galleries and artists work together in relationship to the sales model uh, and pool the sales together and, and create a, a more, uh, well, let's say, equitable uh, fair. And these works that you've been creating, you've been creating them for a few years. Uh, I know that they're entitled Pelts, and I was wondering where you came up with that title for the, the cardboard pieces that you see in the background, drawings as you call them, right? Mm. Um, I call them Pelts because basically like this is one of them here without the frame, and um, I, I can show you the other side of it also. Um, Um, this is X cardboard. Um, it was cardboard when I found it, and then I kind of ex I had a process by which I deconstructed the cardboard, put it into a bat of water, and the stratas of the corrugation and so on. The glue broke down, and then I kind of scraped away all of that and just left the exterior where the graphics are and that kind of um, process of scraping away the cardboard and the corrugation for me was akin to a tanner making leather and for that reason I kind of decided to call them pelts because I had been making them working along ideas of, of masks and something a bit more um, primordial I guess and kind of visceral ideas and so the pelt seemed to be an interesting kind of play on that because it was uh, the process of, of, of um, processing the cardboard into, into, into paper because essentially it starts off with cardboard which is this kind of iconic material in and of itself and then you kind of re return the cardboard to paper which is like uh, you know, and one of the elemental kind of like drawing surfaces or art making surfaces that people have used through the ages. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore that kind of ties directly into a, a drawing practice. I mean, I never considered myself to be a painter because that has a whole canon and kind of historical baggage that goes along with that. I don't want to enter into that arena. For me, like drawing is a much kind of more open definition of what I do and it's kind of composition and, you know, but then also it's kind of ideas of what you're doing. It's kind of a, comp uh, a conceptual element to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, as you were mentioning, it, it is a very visual kind of practice with this cardboard is you're, you're skinning the cardboard to create these tans, uh, you know, the pelts uh, it's, it, and, and creating that into a paper. It makes, it makes better sense, I think. Um, they're also painted with, even though you're not calling yourself a painter, there's, there's also this neo data sensibility in the work because they have, uh, you know, they're working with a found object and they're working with found marks. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit to, you know, how you are making these drawings or these mark, you know, marked cardboards of sorts, pelts. Um, well, first of all, you know, they, they were kind of a byproduct of a longer practice I had with cardboard in which um, I had been making these inflatable cardboard boxes and there's a few of those in the corner here. And they're also part of the Future Fair um, works that are on view. And um, I guess a long time ago when I was operating out of Belfast, um, Again, I kind of began this process of, of deconstructing cardboard and turning it into paper. And somehow along the line, I arrived at this uh, idea of inflating a cardboard box because it seemed like such a, um, 
absurdist challenge to do that. Um, and I spent about six months or more fixating on how do you inflate a cardboard box. And, um, you know, and I, I eventually did it, but it was kind of such a, it was such a kind of um, a futile effort, focus and uh, effort. But at the time I was in, what I was really interested in was subverting that kind of Kuhnsian dynamic of like taking a lowly object and raising it up into this kind of edification. So you take the inflatable bunny and then you give it away to some like super high end German craftsmen and they deliver a replica of that thing to you out of cast uh, chrome. And this thing is now like, um, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world. And so rather than that kind of up, this, this kind of vertical shift, I wanted to do a lateral, that was interesting to do a lateral shift. Take something that's cardboard and turn it into something that's like a crappy inflatable um, as a way to kind of like subvert that upward motion and kind of speak more to a democratization of, of, of thinking about, you know, uh, that movement and kind of so that was what I started doing so I was making these little boxes for a long time and then a lot of the time obviously I'm discarding parts of the cardboard and throwing it away and once uh, I did this project called um, demonic interventions with IKEA furniture uh, with a friend of mine and we kind of hit upon this play on the contemporary meets um, the primordial and um and the mask the mask which is kind of like a long-running modernist motif uh kind of came into play into the work and then i noticed that um you know <clears throat> with boxes you you find a cardboard box and it has these um holes in them they have these little kind of handles or air vents or so on apertures um, and some of them i would find would have just a cardboard box with not graphics in terms of text but actually just like a blue rectangle and i was thinking you know working in a commercial high-end commercial gallery that like deals with mid-century minimalist work I was like this looks almost exactly like a Richard Serra work except for the Richard Serra work is worth hundreds of millions of dollars and this thing is a piece of cardboard on the street but but you know I uh, iconographically they're kind of the same and it's really interesting and that and, and that kind of like I've always been interested in in the power of like a mark in a field like if you see a mark, like, you know, if you make a Stone Age man makes a mark on a, on a cave wall and that mark just speaks to us in a certain way. And like in the same way that like just this square on a cardboard box just kind of has power to it. Uh, so I, I started thinking about these relationships between cardboard boxes as being on the lower end of the, you know, uh, uh, aesthetic hierarchy. And, um, the, these these kind of all this modernist language and so on of like um, minimalist work and Bauhaus work and so on. And I was thinking it'd be interesting to use these orifices maybe to make a kind of quasi anthropomorphic um, like image with the face, but and, and then also superimpose graphics onto the graphics that already were existing that were kind of gleaned from more aesthetically rarefied uh, modernist and postmodernist traditions that coexisted with the uh, um, coexisted with the graphics that are already there, and that and then it was kind of a game that goes along in terms of like what did I add and what was already there, and like you know I, I couldn't really replicate the industrial screen printing process that the manufacturers used to create the cardboard boxes themselves initially. But what I could do is I actually worked out a way I could mimic that on a one-off basis by using uh, stenciling and using aerosol tape to give you that, uh, excuse me, aerosol paint 
to give you that flat, dense, matte kind of color feels um, to create Very those cool. kind of like industrial like graphics. Uh, right. And, and I mean, and, and that further emphasizes the democratization of the box in relationship to its industrial kind of mark. And then you're mimicking the industrial mark. I mean, sometimes even mocking in some ways, you know, with the eggs piece uh, and, and, and making sure that it fits almost like a puzzle, almost as if you always knew it was there. Well, the egg thing with the E E G G S S is kind of like, again, a play on the data tradition of um, taking text out of context. And um, where if you turn a letter upside down, it ceases to me, it ceases to be a shape that we read and just be a shape that has its own inherent qualities beyond its. Um, pictorial value as a letter and and if you know so it was like definitely um you know the Dallas and James um Hatfield and people like that who were kind of using um text as text out of context as a, a formalistic kind of and playful and absurdist uh strategy which is kind yeah. of I mean everything I kind of do has that kind of playfulness shot through it in some way or other. And it's kind of like uh, all, always a tight road to walk if you're kind of going to be trying to be. Well, certainly, I mean, some of the works are in, deliberately upside down in relationship to the text. Uh, they're right that's side because, up in relationship yeah, to the drawing. That's to subvert the reading of it. You don't want people, sometimes like if you put text right way up in front of people, they won't see the whole thing. They'll just gravitate towards reading text because that's what we're pre, pre-programmed to do. And, uh, you know, in the same way that we're pre-programmed to see faces, which is kind of interesting because, like, I, I can't remember the scientific term right now, um, but the reason that we see faces in clouds and mountains and bushes and whatever else is because there's a disproportionate amount of our brain giving over to seeing faces in our environment because it's a survival strategy. If you see a face, that means that's another person and you need to work out really fast. Do you know that person? Do they have an angry face because they're coming at you with an ax to cut your head off? Or is this someone, is this a safe person or is this someone you need to, do I run right now? And you have a split second and you're, you know, nature has made, so, so that's why we go around seeing faces all the time in, in clouds and so on. So it's kind of interesting to play on that. I think that's why one of the reasons masks in, in the kind of modernist context. And then, you know, <clears throat> the demonic intervention piece started off with the idea that Picasso had gone to Africa and got all these masks and brought them back to, um, Europe and kind of used them as the underpinning of formulating um, cubism, but it was a kind of like um, it would now be called as a culture. What he did then would now be considered to be a cultural misappropriation. Um, but in 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 those times, it was like a major, you know, artistic innovation. Um, so, because it was an extremely um, European-centric, like, take on these on these masks, and and the play of the demonic interventions was that um, the the spirit of these demons in the demonic forces in these masks was never given their proper dues, so they kind of lived on through the history of modernism in the glue that kind of held, you know, like. Cubism begot Bauhaus begot Ikea and that they're still in there and that you can kind of like encant them into being by using certain processes. Uh, so that, I love so, listening about the, uh, demonic interventions with Ikea furniture. Would you have any thing to, do you have any images of that to share so we can get a little better idea of
So you can see this one here, I'm assuming. And this is a good friend, Jessamine, who was a model for the f uh, our first, the first Ikea drawings. And this is uh, the Ikea style um, graphics. But in this one, rather than just the self-assembly, you can see that she is um, about to plunge a large uh, knife into the back of a goat and then and sacrifice this thing. And um, then uh, she's drinking its uh, still warm blood and then wearing its head pelt as a headdress. And then um, she's taking a bone from the pile of bones and then she's um, duct taping on a screwdriver bit to kind of fashion this like bone tool. And then um, she sets about assembling this um, sculpture made from all these different pieces of Ikea furniture. Um, and, uh, you know, that brings her to here where she has assembled this huge kind of like mega um, sculpture. And then at the end of it, uh, her bone tool becomes charged with demonic energy because she's completed this process. And, you know, part of the um, idea of this was that you didn't need to buy the sculpture from me. And uh, I was kind of circumnavigating the role of the artist and I kind of gave a, 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 lit, uh, um, a list of the pieces of Ikea furniture that you would need to buy to just go and build this sculpture yourself. Um, which kind of just referencing a kind of utilitarian uh, tradition in, in, in certain um, 20th century art. But the first thing you have to buy is a female goat uh, and then all these other pieces of furniture. Um, <laughs> this was a quite successful iteration. I remember the um, all the the books sold out. It was, what was it? An edition of a hundred or something? Or well, five hundred. Five hundred. Well, I think we actually. I think printed matter actually got together to produce three hundred of what they had initially called the five hundred uh, run, and then after that they didn't produce anymore. So. Technically, they owe us 200, but I don't think we've ever seen them. <laughs> well, I know that I, I, folks have asked about them uh, to the gallery and, you know, for birthday presents or just special gifts, and it's been really hard to procure them. So no, it's crazy. It's like they've taken on a kind of, like, I, I personally have two. And I think Angus might have two or three. So we have almost none, and, and then there's a few floating around, and then people are always asking for them. If I had, you know, another 500, I think we could probably sell them. I mean, if they seem to have taken on a, a certain kind of cachet since we made them first, and but we don't have any, any of them to monopolize on that, unfortunately. The, the, the idea of the furniture and uh, the assemblage of the furniture, and this, uh, the Ikea, the Ikeaization uh, of whatnot is sacrifice, but also just being human now and thinking about industry in relationship to other bodies of work that you've been working with. So the industry in Ikea, we, you know, as, as, as consumers go to Ikea and collect our um, furniture and then we build it ourselves. Whereas also the box, was a box that was meant for commercial use and now uh to you know from from industry to the seller or to the the middleman of sorts and so in each case now in uh self-isolation quarantine the lockdown how you're going to put it uh th this idea of the cardboard box also becomes uh, where the, the middleman has been taken out again, this, this 
you know, often the grocer, I mean, we're still going to the grocery store, don't get me wrong, but people are buying in droves on Amazon and other organizations, just, you know, getting their food delivered for fear that they don't want to go outside if they're immunocompromised, you know, in, in, in this day. So, yeah, it, you know, I don't know if it, it, you're able to kind of d address also this middleman being taken out, but also the artist as interventionist. Uh, and where you come in, in both of these instances, further, uh, maybe some of this idea within the data sensibility or the neo-data sensibility, it, it's also very much a, a fuck you. Like, it's a very punk rock thing to do to say, I don't need the middleman or I'm going to take this and, and, and spin modernism on its head. I know you've addressed modernism a little bit, but I am really interested in hearing about that art as um, interventionist. Well, <clears throat> the cardboard thing itself is, I mean, you know, this is kind of like super nerdy stuff, like real ca cardboard nerdiness. But, you know, it used to be a time when a cardboard box was made by Kellogg's made a box. They made a cardboard box to put 24 boxes of cornflakes into. And they did a one color screen print with a Kellogg's chicken on the outside of it and the words Kellogg's. And I went off to the supermarket. And as long as the guy in the supermarket who owned the supermarket knew that there was Kellogg's cornflakes in that box, that the box had done its job. And it didn't have to be a super sophisticated graphic. It just needed to do that. And then when he pulled the cornflakes out, the cornflakes had, you know, uh, eight color screen print system so that the, re the consumer would buy the nice attractive box, right? And that was the way it was. And, and, and the cardboard boxes obviously have been um, landed upon by a number of artists over the years. I'm by no means the first artist to use cardboard notably Robert Rauschenberg with his card bird, B-I-R-D, with his kind of like uh, wordplay on that, making uh, these pieces in the 60s, I believe. And, um, and these were kind of, again, canonical pieces. Uh, but since then, with the advent of uh, online shopping, you know, now, you go to buy something from Amazon, it comes directly to you. There's, it doesn't go to a supermarket and then come to you, it just goes to you. And <clears throat> the cardboard box that it came in is now kind of more geared to arrive in the hands of the retailer than the previous one was. And actually, you know, my whole cardboard gig could be out of commission pretty soon because I know that both Google and Amazon are trying to rethink the cardboard box. It's kind of actually, the cardboard box is kind of this, this you know, uh, interface. And it's kind of a, you know, funny, weird thing that it has become such an iconic material because it is very easily produced. It is relatively ecological because the glue is actually kind of very, it's, it's a, a vegetable glue. It's paper, it's, it's structural, it's cheap, and we're all used to it as being consumers our whole entire lives. I don't think any of us can remember being born into a world prior to cardboard boxes existing. Maybe we were delivered into well, cardboard wasn't boxes. Wasn't the cardboard box, yeah. uh, pardon, pardon for interrupting, but wasn't the cardboard box born and raised in Brooklyn? Wasn't it the sack that came first? It was you that told me that because yeah, the sacks I, wouldn't I mean, stack. By, by, I mean, I got this information from the, you know, my esteemed friend, Liz Nielsen, told me that um, the cardboard box was actually, um, you know, conceived in Brooklyn. So maybe me coming here was like a salmon rip swimming up river to the spawning ground uh, of cardboard boxes, but um, here we are. But I mean, the thing you're talking about with this cardboard box is now we've, even, you know, like we've cut shops out of, the, out of the equation completely because now mostly each, our relationship to commercial, you know, world is going on your computer, tapping a few keys, and then waiting 36 hours, and then someone puts a card, a box in your hand, and there you've got stuff. 
Um, I mean, I've bought a ton of stuff since I've been in the house and just boxes appear. And there's kind of that gratification that comes along with online shopping as well, that you just kind of go on a whim and buy something and then it just appears. Um, and yeah, in terms okay. of- but, but not to be confused with the fact that you are very choosy with the boxes that you choose to skin and then make into either an inflatable or a pelt, correct? I mean, there has to be some strong aesthetic power in the box for you to actually engage with it. And I'm wondering what, what are the ideal things that you're looking for in these boxes? I mean, they're everywhere. I mean, I know, not to sound trite, but you know, the, the, the trope of the FedEx box, even though you created that inflatable behind you so many years ago, uh, it's now more than ever, just it's oozing with relevance, right? Yet you're not gonna go around and make all sorts of inflatables with cardboard um, made from FedEx boxes because our carbon footprint needs to be tamed. Uh, I am just interested in the choice of your, of uh, the box well, that you've I've made, I've made two FedEx inflatable boxes thus far. And um, that's not an endorsement of FedEx per se. It's just uh, FedEx is kind of an iconic brand. And also just, I like their logo. They have a, they have a cool logo. And they use a kind of, uh, they use a kind of a weird purple that nobody else uses. So it's kind of a nice and attractive um, logo. And, and also it has, you know, um, power. You can, you see that people identify to it. And also FedEx don't really put very much else on their box. They just put the word FedEx and leave the rest of it clear, which I appreciate the minimalism of that design. Um, I mean, I actually have, tons and tons of pieces of cardboard that I have uh, brought home and that I'll probably never live long enough to process into art. So I'm not as discerning as you know you might think with cardboard. I just find it. I actually have to cull it and throw it away because I just, I, I can't get into my studio because I have too much of it. Um, but, yeah. I know someone else that has a lot of cardboard. And uh, Liz Nielsen is asking a question right now uh, on the chat. And she says, Clive, have you ever ordered an item just for the box? Or do you have a dream cardboard box to make a mask or inflatable of, either from the past or current? And of course, Liz Nielsen is the co-founder of Elijah Reed Showroom. So I'm very happy to have her here. Um, I, I don't think I've ordered a particular thing for a box because I'm not quite sure what the box they would turn up in is FedEx box. I did, I, I did take the box from an 80 inch television in my place of employment and um, rebuild another box for it so that I could inflate that box. Um, so that was definitely box um, fetishism at that moment. Um, and my ideal cardboard box, um, uh, I mean, I just interesting graphics. I mean, if you, if you had a box, I mean, if I had like a box that looked like Malovich made it, that would probably be my ideal box. <laughs> uh, well, the, you know, I don't want to belabor the idea of the box because you make so many uh, fantastic iterations of different types of inflatables, but also sculptural work um, and some really fantastic uh, assemblages or ready-mades, as you may also refer them to, neo-ready-mades. But the um, things I see behind you, uh, they feel new to me. Are those some of the things that you've been you know, whipping out during the time in isolation here in New York City? Um, one thing we've made is, um, a little replica fire. I'm kind of in love with right now. And uh, Are those I think they're like little pieces of wood, offcuts of wood and some painted paper and um, 
I made this with my two uh, studio assistants I'm here in lockdown with, um, Olivia and Hazel, and we painted some, uh, <laughs> Painted, painted, painted some really great flames and I actually love it because you know you can't not respond to fire to a good campfire kind of a cave fire you know it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a primordial thing I want to make more of these definitely different kind of little fires but they also um, you know hanging above me are um, these are the, from the interior of the box comes a little um, airbag. And uh, I was thinking, you know, kind of interesting. And I just strapped some elastic band around them. This, this thing here is just a hanging apparatus. So I can, I can coat them in resin and the res resin drip off. Um, and uh, then they take on this kind of architectural form. Um, it's kind of like a weird um, shape. And you know, after I put this applied resin to it, that's why it's white rather than clear. And then, you know, amalgamate a couple of them and make painted black or whatever. And becomes the black kind of with the inflatable gives it kind of a definite fetishistic kind of quasi s and M kind of vibe to it. And also there's a long tradition of like, you know, um, utopian architecture, uh, inflatable architecture that was kind of playing. I don't know if you can see that or not. Anyway, so there's that. And then, um, another version of that is kind of a, big wad of bubble wrap wrapped in some twine with some uh, plastic forks on it. And this thing is like solid now. Um, and the whole thing has been just kind of like coated in six layers of resin. And eventually I'll probably paint this maybe to, kind of has like a, you know, it has a kind of a strange, you know, could be like a little bit like ceramic, also, it has an interesting totemic form to it. Um, and again, it's just kind of like a very casual assemblage, but you know, maybe in, in tradition of uh, Franz West or something like that. Uh, I recently had someone ask me um, for about a couple of the inflatable boxes. They are inflated with the artist's air and uh, the, you know, the, the interested collector was saying that, well, will that, how long would that air last? And, uh, you know, is it really the artist's air? And, uh, you know, I assured them that it was. Uh, but I, I am curious as to how long do you know a box to, to stay inflated? I mean, the, it's kind of a tricky one because they're very much subject to uh, temperature. And uh, if it gets really hot, um, they sag, I think, or is it the other way around? I can't remember. Uh, air pressure and temperature um, are inter, uh, intertwined. The hotter it is, the um, less pressure, more pressure it is. And then they get kind of softer. They can't fly inflated either. Uh, if they fly, I, I learned this the hard way. I sold four of them to a collector in Italy and from, and they were sent from a, a gallery in Dublin. And I wasn't there to kind of oversee the shipping. And they, they sent them inflated and when they got to Italy, they were all bust open because when they got to the plane, the plane flew up and the air pressure reduced so much, the, they, they expanded and, and split. So I, just, I had to make them four more oh. and send them uninflated this time. So I don't know about the artist's air. I mean, I, I wouldn't, first of all, claim to call any air my air. I mean, it's everyone's air. And uh, secondly, um, you know, I don't know anyone really covered air that had come from my lungs particularly. So, I mean, it's like... <laughs> well, it's part of the game, I suppose. 
sorry, go ahead. Well, it's just part of ownership and, and, and it's playful. It's, it's as playful as you shot. It's you champion in its way, you know, it's like, well, yeah, we'll I mean, but it's also kind of like, what do you call it? Um, the art of Vera, like canned feces, you know, it's like bagged air, you know, um, but, um, yeah. I mean, for me, to again, like the inflatable box was just really like, I mean, first of all, it's a consumer package that's really very tightly full of nothing. And, um, and also like, it's, I, don't, I just don't know why I, I did it. It was a really stupid thing to do. Um, but it just kind of like, I was like, that is so ridiculous that I kind of have to do it, you know? And I spent like literally six months like doing like version after version and using latex and all sorts of stuff to inflate a cardboard box. And, and it was definitely, it was kind of a eureka moment that the world didn't care about. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, an, <laughs> it was, I remember like, yeah, it was, it was just, it was, it was like, but it was funny, you know? And then, I made them and people seem to have gravitated towards them. They kind of uh, represent something to people. I've made them for a long time now. So, and I, it's kind of like, I try to stop making them and then I can't because um, every time like I, you know, someone will, I want to do a trade with somebody, an artist I respect uh, and I have this going on right now and they'll say to me like, I said, I really want to do a trade with you. And I said, okay. So what do you want? It's like, well, I absolutely want one of those inflatable cowboy boxes. So I kind of have to make them one then, you know? It's like, so I can't even not make them, you know? It's, uh, it's I mean, I've been making them uh, since when I, when I met Heather first, my wife, uh, she's like this young know, American lass that I met in Belfast. And she used to come around to my studio after she had been out in the town with her girlfriends. And she'd like come around and help me latex, like blow dry latex in my studio in Belfast. And, you know, I was like, she's like, you know, thinking, I was like, you know, I'm never going to have any money. Like I'm here in fl like inflating cardboard boxes. It's utterly ridiculous, you know. Um, <laughs> it was, then it was love. No money. Yeah, you're mine. Just, my point being that like, I've been doing, making these things for, you know, a good portion of my adult life, which is kind of ridiculous and funny. Well, they they are unique, although they they kind of you know you you use you say things like a, a, a folly of cardboard carnage. Sometimes I know I really like that term. But, uh, you have made other things, like for instance, I see the the toaster behind you that is quite iconic in your practice. If you could turn that on, and then. Maybe we can look at the screen um, again because there are some larger works that you've created, like the the giant installation of an inflatable. Ah, there's the toaster. In um, the knock. Neon. Mm -hmm. see that. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's a, a toaster with a neon. Um, element coming out of it that replicates in some way the uh, <clears throat> the um, elements, the, uh, the heating elements in that toaster, but it's kind of brought out in a three-dimensional form that um, kind of moves into, again, a, a formalistic, uh, you know, uh, composition, and then goes back into the toaster. So it's, again, a play of, like, um, artistic convention and then kind of um, a somewhat playful absurdist play on, on a toaster. Um, but then the toaster is a very particular toaster. It's a Krupp toaster that has almost no features and is just completely a, a, a seamless chrome object. Um, so yeah. And then um, and then the, the larger inflatables that you were creating, I know um, Liz and I have seen just, I don't know, maybe it was eight, nine years ago, um, your work first in a space and uh, just taking over the space with this large inflatable. And then this one, I was lucky enough to help in production, uh, curated by Justin Fiore, 
called Two Machines. Is that correct? Uh, that was the show. Um, yeah. I mean, this one was untitled, I believe. Um, but the show was called Two Machines, and it was great. Um, it's a cool show. I mean, obviously, I was very happy and lucky to get the use of that really unique space in Brooklyn, um, or Queens, actually, I guess, Mass Uh And um, it's such a huge space, and we were able to fill it with these kind of monumental uh, inflatable works. And I used um, mylar that I bought from people in the West Coast for growing your own weed and um you know blue tarps and clear plastic and then black trash bags and it kind of like came together to create this um the still kind of mondrian-esque um aesthetic with the black corners kind of punctuating the composition and then the silver and the blue and the red and the i guess white um kind of creating these um compositions within this piece and again it, it has this I guess Z or, or at least a straight with two ends coming out of a composition you can see in the center then there was a large shelf that we got from the industrial era shelf shelving rack that we got from the knockdown center that we put the fan on and all sorts of things and it was didactics I had built in there telling you about the history of in uh, um, radical inflatable architecture and um, so and that was also kinetic in the sense that the motor would cut out every so often the whole thing would collapse and then before it hit the ground it would just kind of rise up again and it was, it was kind of dynamic in that way um, but this was almost like a public uh, display because the space is just so big um, yeah, it was, I mean there's nowhere else in New York I could have done that piece it was like and I had done one previously in a kind of a similar space, but not as kind of majestic, I guess, as the knockdown center, which was the soap factory in Minneapolis. And they had got me to do um, a huge piece there where I did they had three main galleries and it was kind of your quintessential post-industrial space that had literally been a soap factory in the same way that the knockdown center had been a knockdown door factory. And um, and I just built these geometric inflatables. And again, I, you know, I was kind of playing on the same thing where you're trying to create like, um, you know, a solid esque kind of geometric gridded form, but do it in inflatables, which are kind of generally considered to be big, bouncy, globule, playful, not serious things. And that kind of hierarchy of, of making very rigid. How do you make an inflatable not look like an inflatable? Uh, how do you make it look like a large mid-century alpha male sculpture? Um, you know, and so <laughs> that was kind of my my play on that. Um, it's kind of to to establish something and then undercut it simultaneously. You know. Um, I mean, something of, like that the the production on that took about five days full days or something i mean it was all planned and it was really uh well executed uh, i do appreciate the kinetic aspect of that piece we'll have to find a video of it working at, at one point uh it, it was really magnificent breathing almost uh in its in its shell with the, uh, the other, you, you had another work that involved, was it a billboard? Uh, something that, that also served as like a, a public sculpture of sorts that was a large scale artist intervention on the landscape. Well, going back to this kind of formalistic interest in just kind of shapes and lines and the mark and um, playing on like, you know, like, I'm, I'm drawn to minimalist art, but then I'm also conscious of the political, um, the political element to it, particularly when it's time and kind of how it was like rarefied and somewhat exclusive. And in some ways that era can be seen as almost problematic now. And, um, but at the same time, like the work, 
can be so compelling. And, and in some ways, I was interested in the idea that like something that is whole, if you take a certain part of it, just isolate one aspect of it, it can kind of have this whole power of within itself, you know. Um, so anyway, when I came to New York first, I was really interested in seeing these disused uh, billboard structures on tops of buildings. They would be silhouetted when I go on a, on an overground train. I'd see them on, particularly in Queens, and it's these beautiful geometric structures. And I also came across this idea, imagine if you were to delineate parts of them, within any one of them, they have all these different potential compositions. And if you were to like just delineate compositions within the whole, uh, it would be kind of interesting. So I never got to do it in New York, but I did do a version of it in um, the Franconia Sculpture Center in Minneapolis, which is probably one of the darkest places in the world at night because it's like in the middle of Minnesota. And um, where is it now? Let me see. Okay, so this structure is not a billboard. It's actually um, a billboard-esque form that was, uh, that I was constructed uh, in the sculpture park. So this is the closest I got to actually getting one of these pieces made in real life. But this is exactly, obviously, the concept delivered upon. And then I contacted a manufacturer of um, this material called uh, LED neon. So it's essentially LED in the flexible strips that is so packed together that it has the exact, uh, it has the exact look of neon. And, it, and then it fits into these metal aluminum tracks. So you're able to create very kind of geometric lines with it. And what I did was I put five, shapes within the existing architecture of this you know metal construction and you can see this is slightly speeded up now but um, as the light shifted particularly and each one of these shapes was actually on for a minute but i've just sped through it on this thing here um, so these kind of at particularly at night time these red shapes would just kind of hang high in the Minnesotan night sky. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the idea. I mean, it's, it's, they're, all, they're all parts of that composition that makes that structure. But isolated from the structure are these kind of really beautiful shapes and compositions that kind of are within that are kind of invisible within the whole, but, but brought to the fore uh, have, have a real power to them. And again, it's kind of a mark in a field. And when I say a field, I mean like um, a compositional field that with, with the night sky being the field. Um, it's really stunning, Clive. Uh, Liz was asking, how did you program the shapes? Um, I programmed the shapes by going to a person smarter than myself, which is always a good thing to do. And a um, good, good friend of mine, Jonathan Shipper, he set up an Arduino system where we uh, could program the signal to change between five channels. It was five individual shapes. And then we built that, and I, you know, I, I kind of got a proper electrical box, and I, I did the whole thing really legit. I got the Arduino built in there, and um, I was in, you know, this kind of place in in, uh, in Franconia for like two weeks building this thing. It was quite quite a 
elaborate thing. I was really, elaborate. I really loved that project. I really wish one day I could do it in New York, but uh, it's never come. I, I nearly had permission to do it on the, um, Hank will know, the billboard above the Nostrand subway station, directly above there. I was in contact with the people who owned that building and I had the um, Brooklyn Restoration people behind me, Restoration Plaza people, and they were kind of being advocates for me in the community. And um, I, I was kind of like that close to getting the guy who owned the building to give me, I had a Brooklyn Arts Council grant and whole lot, all things coming together. And he, he, he kind of like, didn't give me to go ahead. He he kind of told me, yeah, I know I can't do it now, but maybe in a year, knowing that by that stage, all my ducks in a row would no longer be in a row; it'd be all over the place. And and uh, and he was right, you know. So, but <laughs> well, the 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 frame itself is built on with wood, correct? That one was metal. It was like uh, oh, it was all metal. So in the same way, exactly the same as the ones that are here in, in Brooklyn. I mean, the reason it's interesting about them because the ones that are here in Brooklyn that are disused, the, the, for a greater reason, the reason they're on tops of buildings is they're just too expensive to take down. No one's using them for anything. They're not actually being active billboards. The, the billboards that make money are those huge monopedal ones, like a massive single... Um, like a single truss point, and then they have two of them, and you drive them down to BQE and see them. They're the ones that make money. These ones that you see on tops of buildings are kind of a, um, you know, they're uh, totally antiquated. They're actually kind of like some historical aspect of the city. Um, but from my aesthetic, I find them incredibly compelling. I just think they're gorgeous, like just silhouetted against the sky. They are gorgeous. I think that they're cost prohibitive for um, any marketing or advertising people and companies to invest in. I don't know if they're owned by Clear Channel or something. Uh, I, don't know if, I, know, I don't know who owns them anymore. But, the, but they're I just mean, too much. Obviously, obviously, they've become their own icon. I mean, you know, like they've become like a signifier of like a post-industrial urban landscape. Uh, in the same way that, somewhat in the same way that the Brooklyn Water Tower has become like a brand. I don't think the, the water, the, the, the um, you know, obviously with Brooklyn Industries kind of co-opted the Water Tower as their, mm. you know. I think not only Brooklyn Industries, but I think most images or the iconic glyph of Brooklyn is the Water Tower. Uh, yeah, whether or not the, guy who did, <laughs> the glass multicolored ones that is you know became a bit cheesy but whatever like i mean um, <laughs> very nice uh we're yeah, creeping I, up on I, four more minutes I mean, uh till well, seven yeah 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 <laughs> i was wondering if anyone had any questions they might want to ask um certainly you know, go ahead and, um, I don't know, Clive, if there's anything else you wanted to get to, if there aren't any questions. Oh, Lizzie, um, what is brewing in your mind during COVID times? Like what's next? What, what is next? Well, the campfires, I suppose you were talking a little bit about, but do you have any larger planned projects? Um, no, just continuing to make the things that I make. I mean, I try to do my studio practice. Obviously, I can only ever do anything in the evenings, first of all. I have the kids all day long. So when they go into bed, I have a couple of hours to do something. So maybe one evening I will coat airbags in resin. And then the next evening I will like cut a, a dovetail joint in a piece of wood. And then the next evening, you know, if I don't go out and drink wine with Heather in the backyard, that is, uh, I will then, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, try and make one of these drawings. So basically, I'm, and then the fires as well. I'm just trying to keep the few plates I have spinning, give them all a little bit of a turn. 
and keep it all moving along. But I haven't, I don't have any grand plans on the horizon because the horizon seems pretty fuzzy right now. And I'm not quite sure if it's a mirage or a real horizon or what's going on. That's for real. I don't know if we can see the ship at the end. I don't even know if we can see the horizon. Uh, it's, it is, it's kind of trying times, but it, it is maybe a hopeful moment to think about that Zephyr project to potentially, uh, Liz had mentioned she would like to see it on a bridge or, you know, a, a, even in uh, billboards now where buildings are being abandoned, as people are leaving the city in droves. Uh, I mean, certainly certain areas, uh, businesses are closing out real estate market is buyer's market uh, all this in nine months who knows what's going to happen you know over the summer and into the fall perhaps uh, you can secure that project again and you know recreate that zephyr in new york city as it was you know inspired by the city it would be a really fantastic endeavor well we'll see you know i mean uh it's in a very cheesy way. It's kind of like a piece about the beauty within something. So maybe we can find that, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's been a number of people who've tried to do it and it's failed every time, but I mean, I'm Irish, so I'm kind of like failure is something we're kind of like, it's our birthright. So, uh, <laughs> it keeps you moving forward. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the time that you, that you spent with me today on the Zooms and in your studio to make time. Uh, and, and certainly thanks to Heather for taking, wrangling the kids away from the studio. I was, maybe we were going to get a guest appearance from me, <laughs> but <laughs> it didn't work. Um, and thank you so much for everyone that tuned in for this casual studio visit artist talk uh, with the Live Beach Showroom. And we're really excited to have Clive's work up on Future Fair. And hey, Joe. <laughs> um, and uh, Ivana and Anne-Marie, thank you so much for being here as well. We're uh, closing out. And for any of you who missed, hey, Catherine, any of you that missed the, um, beginning or any of the portion of this we're recording it and we're going to put it up in youtube in the very near future again thank you so much clive stay well and we'll see you on the flip side thank you so much carolina take yeah. care thank Ciao. you everybody Bye.